so nasty. All right, you ready? Yep. Here we go. It is week eight. It is Tuesday. It is summer 2022. Let's talk about the intraventricular septum and ventricular septal defects. So that, of course, is the tissue that separates the right from the left ventricles. It lies deep to, you remember, the interventricular sulcus or groove back in anatomy days? There's an anterior interventricular sulcus, uh, which contains the branches of the coronary arteries. So it's deep to that. Uh, it's much thicker than the intraatrial septum, obviously. The ventricles are much more powerful. It still has a little tiny membranous portion you guys usually don't know. Uh, which is the number one spot for holes to develop. There's a picture of it. So it's pretty thick and powerful. There's the left ventricle, which is super powerful. And there is a little tiny skinny membranous portion right there. Uh, and that can be troublesome because it's quite thin. It's thickest at the middle, like right here. You see, this is the thickest part of it, right in the very middle. It's thinnest at the membranous portion. Uh, the bundle of his and the, or AV bundle is located within the membranous portion of the ventricular septum. That's why it's clinically an important area. All right, so not too much anatomy to review. Let's get into the ventricular septal defects. Strangely enough, technically, you don't call these intraventricular septal defects, even though it's a hole in interventricular septum. For whatever reason, you call them ventricular septal defects. Uh, these are a member of the cyanotic heart disease family, according to some, but not all authors. That is a big mess, the way they categorize things. Uh, but we will call them cyanotic heart disease members. Uh, they're congenital. I could have added that in there because you're born with this thing and it's just a hole. You're born with a hole somewhere in the interventricular septum. A claim to fame, it is the most common congenital cyanotic heart defect in the pediatric population. Remember, ASDs was the most common hole uh, in the adult population that develops. you remember why that was? Why would the ventricular septal defect be the most common one in pediatric populations? You're going to have problems immediately pretty much. Immediately pretty much because the ventricle contractions are so powerful that tons of blood gets pushed over into the right heart. And you remember that, that weird word that develops? which raises the pressure on the right side of the heart. It starts with an E. It's like Eisenmenger syndrome. Eisenmenger syndrome will start quite rapidly in people with significant holes in the interventricular septum. Just said all that stuff. Yep, they get, lungs get bombed with too much blood. Uh, the microcirculation gets irritated, inflamed, and scars up, which creates a beaver dam, which beaver dam is going to back up pressure into the right heart. You're going to have pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and once the pressure in the right ventricle gets above that of the left ventricle, you're going to have a pathological shunting of blood from right to left. The patient's going to be symptomatic. We said that people can tolerate losing oxygenated blood. Okay. If you have a hole and you lose some of the oxygenated blood in the left ventricle, that's okay, no big deal. Does not tolerate the opposite. It does not the oxygenated blood does not stand getting polluted with deoxygenated blood. You'll get very sick. Uh, and, yeah, develop hypoxia. So these ventricular septal defects are definitely more dangerous, more concerning if your child is born with one of these. What are some of the facts, the fun facts, or the epidemiology of this condition? Uh, about 2.5% of live births have this problem. That's that's a, not like Marfan's 0 0.01. That's a decent sized number. So almost three out of 100 are going to have uh, this problem. Uh, most of them are asymptomatic and you never even know they're there. And a lot of times they just scar shut with the passage of time, no big deal. Uh, 
not surprising, most of them are in that skinny little membranous intraventricular septum, which is the thinnest part. So that little thin tissue can develop a hole quite easily. 30% show up in the muscular intraventricular septum. And here's just a cartoon of one right here. So this child is born and there's a hole right in the muscular portion of the interventricular septum. And because of the pressure, this was squirting right into here. So they're losing oxygenated blood. Are they going to have symptoms with this? Probably not yet. Uh, but as soon as the pressure backs up enough to start increasing, once the pressure rises higher on the right side than the left side, and then this deoxygenated blood goes into here, then we have a definite problem. The kid's going to be cyanotic, he's not going to feel good, blue lips, white gums, uh, big trouble once Eisenmenger syndrome starts. There are four atrial septal defects. I always can, this is really easy to make a slide on this. Which one of the following is not one of the four ventricular septal defects? So we just said the membranous ventricular septal defect. Uh, by far the most common, 70% of all of them are of this type in that skinny little uh, intramembranous septum. Uh, they're typically small defects, which is good. There is a little more rare one called a perimembranous ventricular septal defect where a very large hole is present. And that one's not good. Eisenmenger syndrome can start quite quickly from that one. There's a muscular ventricular septal defect about 25% of the pie, this one's fairly common. This occurs in the anterior part of the muscular ventricular septum. That's like the picture we just saw. And then rarely, very rarely, some kids are born without an interventricular septum. Now, is that a good thing? That is not a good thing. Let's move forward. All right, so those are the big four. Let's talk about, we're not going to go through each one of them like we did, the ASDs, but we'll, the small ones, as I kind of said already, no matter where it is, if it's less than or equal to five millimeters in size, that's like the tip of a number two pencil, which we don't really have here, but it's about that big, it's a tiny little hole. Um, usually no big deal, the child doesn't even know they have it. They almost always spontaneously close 10, 11, 12, and the child hits that growth spurt, maybe even before that. Uh, no big deal. Moderate to large ones, so here's someone who died of one. Um, that's a pretty good size hole right there. Picture that under pressure, that's going to be much bigger. Um, so that's an intramuscular, intraventricular septum. And they also have an atrial septal defect as well, All right there. So they can get bigger, those are more worrisome. But even the small ones, when they heal, they're going to scar, and that's going to mess up the blood flow, right? Your laminar blood flow is going to be disturbed. What happens when laminar blood flow gets disturbed? Turbulent. It gets turbulent, but what, what's the worry about non-laminar blood flow? What's the disease that can happen? From both <clears throat> If it's a place it's a place where thrombus can occur especially bacteria so you can get infective endocarditis it's called on these sites where they've healed up because non-laminar flow gives the bacteria a place to kind of grab onto and latch onto and so that's not good so they have to be a little more careful when they go and they have major dental work done they probably should go on antibiotics before that uh, the trouble with uh, infective endocarditis, I guess we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, so that is a bug, uh, and it doesn't have to be on a previous atrial septal defect, or it can be, it can start on the valves. Any rough area can start. It loves like artificial valves or just regular heart valves or scarred up heart valves if you had rheumatic fever and you damaged the valves a little bit gives the place some bugs to latch onto and to multiply like crazy. 
uh, and you can get an inflammation of the inner lining of the heart or the endocardium, uh, and that's called endocarditis. And there's a couple types, or you can call it infective endocarditis. That means that bugs have gotten stuck somewhere on the inside lining of the heart, and they've grown enough to cause a pretty bad inflammation. It's usually in the valves, uh, and they can, I mean, they can accumulate in size to the point they interfere with the valves opening and closing. And then the dangerous place, is, the dangerous thing is they can break loose, and that's like a, an embolism. It is an embolism. It's called a septic embolism. So if it goes in, uh, let's see, it's not going to, well, it depends on what side of the hole it starts. If it starts on the atrial side to go up and cause a stroke or a heart attack, probably going to start on the are on the uh, right side of the heart more than the left side. Why do you think they'd start more on the right side of the heart? Probably end up in the lungs. Where would it, where would it be distance. shorter distance? Where would it, if you were a bug and you're going to stick, would it, sticking to the right side of the heart be easier or sticking to the left side of the heart? Right, right side. Right side. Why? It's a shorter route. It's not as strong. Not shorter. The blood flow. Yeah, there's not as high pressures in there, so. Uh, it's not going to it's not going to rip you off the wall uh, so it's usually on the right side but it can be in the left side as well uh, so it depends what side of the heart is on but it, you can get an embolism they usually end up in the lungs but if it's on the left side it could end up in the brain and cause a stroke um, so people with ventricular septal defects that have closed or if they're still active they should always be given uh, antibiotics prophylactically what's i mean prophylactically beforehand to prevent something from happening, especially dental procedures. Clinical features of a large ventricular septal defect is not good. So anything over 20 millimeters is said to be a large ventricular septal defect. You have to have immediate surgical repair for these things or you're going to die from this. Uh, you'll get a mass of left to right shunt, which will Eisenmenger syndrome can start within hours sometimes especially in the newborns where the heart is not that strong. So these have to be sewed up and fixed really quick, quickly. Okay, let's talk about another one, the tetralogy of Fallot. Do you guys know about this at all a little bit? Uh, so this is one of the congenital cyanotic heart defects. Um, so this is a really easy board question, right? Because it's got four things that make it up so it's really easy to say which of the following is not a member of the tetralogy of flow so to to be the to be diagnosed with tetralogy of flow or tof you have to have four things so you have to have the skinny little and stuck rusty not opening well pulmonic valve so pulmonic valve stenosis and that could mean just the the pulmonic valve itself, the pulmonary trunk is really abnormally skinny. Maybe the pulmonic valve itself is okay, but the trunk is skinny. But it usually means the trunk is skinny and the pulmonic valve is super stiff. So that's number one. Um, and that's, is that going to let blood get out of the right ventricle very good? No, it's not. Uh, number two is you're going to have a run-of-the-mill hole right here. So you're going to have a ventricular septal defect. So we have a communication of the left ventricle with the right ventricle. Number three is sometimes confusing, but you have what's called an overriding ascending aorta. So here's the ascending aorta, which should only connect to what normally? Left ventricle. So it should connect to this thing right here. And you can see if you're Ant-Man and your little Ant-Man submarine, you can drive your submarine right into the ascending the order right here so that's an abnormal connection so that's called an overriding ascending aortic root or aortic arc or aortic ascending aorta and then the last is really just the sequelae of eisenmenger syndrome because if you have this condition where you've got a huge ventricular septal defect and all this blood is bombing the lungs uh, you're gonna the heart, right heart is gonna have to work really really hard to, f to push through uh, the damage that is caused in the microcirculation. So you're going to get right ventricular hypertrophy, which is demonstrated on this cartoon by a really thick, normally thick, right ventricular wall here. 
Okay, so that's Tetralogy of Fallot. Is it a good thing? No. Uh, it's claimed to fame, though. It is the most common cyanotic congenital heart defect, meaning some authors only, categorizes, only categorize the heart defects where you become uh, Isomagnus sigmum starts like within within hours or days. They care, categorize them as a cyanotic congenital heart defects, not months or years to develop. So some people say atrial septal defects and ventricular septal defects are not cyanotic congenital heart diseases uh, because they don't start immediately. It takes a long time, and other authors do, so it's confusing. Our board books do say they're members. Uh, but anyway, so this is the most common of the cyanotic congenital heart defects. And the incidence is four times greater than Marfan's, but still quite rare, 0.04%. Uh, bicuspid, just fun fact, bicuspid aortic valve. How many aortic valves that leaflets are you supposed to have? Or cusps are you supposed to have? Mm -hmm. of a aortic valve. Semi-lunar valve. Three cusps you're supposed to have. So one of the most, the most common congenital heart defect period is something called a bicuspid aortic valve. You're almost always going to need that replaced by the time you're about 40 or so. A thing wears out and gets sticky and doesn't work, becomes stenotic. And you'll ruin your heart if you don't get that thing replaced. 96% uh, of TOF babies will live to the age of 30 if they have the surgical repair. So it's not a great diagnosis. They tend to have other problems uh, even after the surgery. They have bouts of endocarditis and they get infections and they get arrhythmias in the heart. Uh, and so it's just not a great diagnosis. Another one is called transposition of the great arteries. So this one is also quite rare, uh, but transposition means switching places. Uh, so the great arteries, what they're really referring to is the pulmonary trunk uh, and the ascending aorta. Normally the ascending aorta, of course, connects to the left ventricle, but what's going on with this picture? See something strange? It's connected to the wrong chamber, isn't it? So we have the ascending aorta connected to the right ventricle where all the deoxygenated blood is. Is that a good thing? No. And then here's all the oxygenated blood. That's getting shot right back to where? The to the lungs. The lungs are really happy. There's half, they're super oxygenated. Um, and you can't lift like this. So if a child is born with just this transposition, they'll die immediately. Uh, luckily, Almost all the time, probably 98% of the time, they're going to be born with other shunts as well. Uh, like here's a patent ductus arteriosus. Uh, so that's taking this oxygenated blood and actually pushing it over to where it's supposed to be into the aorta here. And they could have a ventricular septal defect that's taking this oxygenated blood and pushing it over here. So at least we get some oxygenation in this. This blood is going to the whole body here. Uh, and then maybe a superior sinus venosa defect is going. So you can have any combination of those and the child can stay alive. So that's transposition of the great arteries. So if I said a question like if a child was born with transposition of the great arteries and no other heart defects at all, what's his prognosis? Yeah. It's really bad. Yeah, he, he won't make it. Yep, they won't make it unless they happen to have a cardiologist cardiology surgeon on staff at the hospital. He happens to be there. Uh, it's a really bad question. So if they were to have other shunts, that would help compensate for the transition? That would keep them alive. Yeah, they're still going to have to have the surgery because these shunts aren't, aren't enough for them to thrive for very long. But once they have surgery, they could just reattach these two uh, to where they belong. They're going to have problems, though. You know, they have endocarditis. They're going to have infections. Uh, but it'll keep them alive. All right, uh, let's go talk more about this infective endocarditis. So uh, we just said we looked at a valve example, but it doesn't have to be a valve example, but it's a bug infection of the endocardium. Uh, and it can be, or some terminology, it can be an infection of the heart valves. That's probably the favorite place for bugs to stick, assuming you don't have a healed up atrial septal defect or ventricular septal defect sticks on the valves, or it could be a mural 
endocardium that could be infected. So you need to know what a mural endocardium is. Well, endocardium is just the lining of the heart of the atria and the ventricles of the heart are lined with the endocardium. So that's what the endocardium is. Mural means that it's everywhere else except the valves. So a mural infective endocarditis means the bugs are latched onto and growing on the chambers, but they've spared the valves. So that's how that is used. Uh, what's the danger of these bugs? I mean, we kind of talked about it. Uh, you could get a bug embolism released, uh, and it depends if it's on the left or right side of the heart how dangerous that is going to be. But they can also do something else besides release. I mean, they invade. They're invasive, and they may invade into the myocardium and cause a myocarditis. Is that a good thing? What powers, what actually makes the heart pump? Is it the endocardium that makes the heart pump? No, where's all the mu it's the myocardium is where all the smooth muscle is. So that's not good to get an inflammation, a damaging inflammation of that. You can lose heart function from that. So that uh, could be a cause of cardiomyopathy. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, one of the problems, uh, it is affecting the heart. In fact, I just saw a study over the weekend just an alarming study to me it was done on kids under 18, I think between 8 and 18, who had received the Pfizer uh, series of vaccinations. And I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I'm fully vaccinated. But I didn't like this. Uh, they did a study and they found almost 20% of the kids had an abnormal EKG a week after uh, and then three months after the, the vaccination. So it is definitely, it's confusing the body where the body attacks the heart. We don't know how it's, what the vaccine is doing. Is it manipulating genes in the heart? We don't know the long-term consequences, but I was like, whoa, I didn't expect that. That's like a huge number. So um, that was done, I think, in Britain. And you'll hear more about that. That'll make, get, it'll catch on. It's still in peer review right now, but the paper looked really, really good. So I'm sure it'll pass peer review. But that's a, a little concerning. And we've heard that before. Young people are getting myocarditis and problems uh, from COVID itself and from the vaccine. So uh, we'll have to keep an eye on that. Uh, another danger. So those bug balls, and of course, I've been calling them bug balls. <laughs> they're, they're not bug balls. There's a word for that. Those are called vegetations. So a little party, a cluster of bacteria that's getting ready to break loose, that's called a vegetation. So these, these bacterial vegetations, they can break loose and they can flow downstream and they can get stuck. And it depends, are they on the right heart or on the left heart? Left heart is big trouble. Right heart is not quite as concerning. You're probably going to end up in the lungs. Uh, but yeah, those are called septic, meaning it's a bug of some kind embolism we know what that is it's thrombus that's broken loose and it's got stuck somewhere uh, the most common bug is of course bacteria so bacterial endocarditis is the most common form of it we can also classify or describe an acute infective endocarditis so what's an acute infective endocarditis that's a new infection on a previously normal heart, they don't have any scarring of the heart. They don't have an atrial septal defect that healed. It's a beautiful new heart. They got an infection maybe from a dental procedure. Streptococcus aureus or Staphylococcus aureus is the, probably the number one. Uh, and yeah, so it attacked and it's stuck to and it's causing trouble in a really brand new heart. That's called acute infective carditis. And there's some examples. They love the valves, getting stuck on the valves. This one's on the right and the left side of the heart. And yeah, it's not good. Uh, the bugs, the valves are, remember in anatomy, they're skinny little thin pieces of tissue, right? So you can imagine they're pretty easily damaged. And that's what happens. It damages the valves. It'll leave scars on the valve if it doesn't completely destroy the valve. So that's in, uh, acute infective endocarditis. Uh, these are typically quite difficult uh, to treat, even with antibiotics. Uh, and oftentimes you have to surgically go in there and literally scrape these 
these vegetations or these bug balls or these bug parties. You literally have to clean up the heart with a scalpel and with a magnification, micro glasses or, or loops or whatever the surgeon likes to use. So it's often fatal. It's not a good diagnosis. A better diagnosis is a subacute infective endocarditis. Um, it's usually caused not by staph, but by uh, viridins streptococci is the number one. There's a whole list of these, but that's the number one. It's not as, as damaging. It doesn't destroy tissue as much, less destructive to the myocardium. It can still damage the valves, though, which is the, the problem with this. Um, antibiotics are usually much more effective at curing this one. They usually don't have to go in surgically to, to fix this problem. So anytime you don't have to do surgery, that's a good thing. Uh, what are the risk factors what, of getting any type of infective endocarditis? If you've had any prior damage or if you have a defective heart valve where laminar blood flow is not doing such a great job at keeping bugs from growing and getting stuck there. Uh, the classic one is rheumatic heart disease. People have had rheumatic fever rheumatic heart disease when they're long they they or when they're young they recover from it but their valves get scarred up um, they're at risk for later in life bugs getting stuck and causing vegetations and trouble a uh, mitral valve prolapse which tends to happen in older people but can happen in younger people again non-laminar blood flow anything that disturbs laminar blood flow will give bugs a chance to latch on and grow uh, degenerative or calcified valves messes up laminar blood flow by more risk factors bicuspid aortic aortic valve here's a nice little cartoon of it so normally there should be three cusps we can see the septum that is formed where where there would be three cusps but it's just scarred together these two are welded together and so we get this narrow little slit which doesn't let blood eject so well ever from the heart uh, and it tends to calcify by the age of about 40 or so. Um, and you're going to need this replaced eventually. But it's a great place for bugs to stick because it's not the three cusp design and the blood flows kind of strangely non-laminarly through uh, this little this little weird valve here. And then all the congenital heart defects, ASD, VSD, uh, PFO, which I mean, we said that's not a congenital heart disease, but it's definitely a heart a hole in the heart. It could be. Uh, where does the infection come from? Dental procedures are notorious for causing this. Surgical procedures, contaminated needles, uh, drug users use. Simple cuts sometimes, especially if you're immunocompromised a little bit. Uh, infection is some other part of the body. You have a pneumonia or you get bit by a spider. Now you have a cellulitis. So well, that could be the source of infection. Uh, the clinical presentation is said to be stormy, quote by Robbins, uh, meaning it, it comes on really, really fast. Fevers, chills, weakness, uh, lassitude, which is a, you guys know that word, lassitude? Lassitude means malaise, lethargy, or flu-like symptoms. It's just another AKA for malaise which could pop up. So lassitude, just don't feel good. Fever is the number one sign though. Always worried when someone's feeling sick and they have a fever and they're older especially. Uh, heart valve related murmur. So clinically, if you auscultate the heart and listen to the heart, uh, you may hear an aortic valve murmur or a left-sided heart murmur where the pressures are higher uh, from the bugs kind of narrowing, uh, narrowing down one of these things. Oops. Um, so listen for any type of murmur. And yeah, so that's present in 90% of those affected. So that's a great way. Um, of course, you can just do blood work if you're in the hospital. You could figure out what the bug is, do an ultrasound, MRI, soft tissue film. You can figure this out, but uh, not good. You gotta, and then you got to make sure you do blood work to call, to find out who the offending organism is so you can give the patient the right antibiotic and try to knock it out. Uh, complications, um, so an autoimmune or immune attack against the heart. Bugs can sometimes hit the glomerulus by mistake. Uh, so the antibodies that are mounted against the invading uh, bug 
Why are my slides not behaving today again? I did this yesterday. Um, yeah, so the, the body makes antibodies for the offending bug, and for whatever reason, it also attacks the kidney, the glomerulus of the kidney, um, and that's not a good thing, right? If the, you get an inflammation, a glomerular nephritis is the inflammation of the nephrons. They can't process, they can't process uh, all the filtrate. They can't filter the blood like they're supposed to, and the the glomerular filtration rate goes like a turtle through the glomerulus. What happens when the filtration rate goes really, really slow through the glomerulus? Who gets very upset and triggers? The macula, remember macula densa? It's always tasting. It's in the distal convoluted tubule. It's tasting salt. If salt is moving really, really slow and, and the, glomerula, the glomerulus is inflamed and not working, uh, it'll sense that as a decrease in salt, uh, and it'll freak out and think there's low blood pressure, even though there's not low blood pressure. And that'll release renin, and then what's going to happen to your blood pressure? Up it goes. So you could get hypertension with this as well. Problematic. Okay, we're done. Do um, you guys know this bird yet? No. It's the spotted tohi. does not like its picture taken. It's always down low on the ground, but every now and then it jumps up high and get a picture of it. But this is a tough one. Spotted tohi. It doesn't have spots. Well, it does have spots on the back of its wings, but it looks kind of like a robin. So if I put robin, it, robins don't have this dark head, right? All right. Are we good? See you guys. I don't know when I'll see you. Tomorrow? Probably.